Ecclesiastes 11, as you know, we're looking at the righteousness of Jesus Christ and seeking the kingdom of God as righteous. That's the theme for the, month, for the year. And in January, we're talking about seeking his righteousness in the area of financial management. There are three people who are concerned about your money. Number one, you're concerned about it. <laughs> I'm concerned about the money that I have to manage, and you're concerned about your money. Number two, God is concerned about your finances. God's very, he is the great investor. Everything you have comes from him, so he's concerned about how it's going. And he tells us where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. So I'm concerned about my finances, you're concerned about yours. God's concerned about it, and then the devil's concerned about it. The devil has a plan for your finances too, and he wants to make it all about you. He wants to make it, get you to do as much as you can to invest in this world instead of your future. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. He wants you to be worried about your finances. He wants you to be stressed out about it. He wants you to be confused about it. He wants you to be self-serving about it. He wants you to be thinking about it all the time. And that's not God's plan. Anything God gives us, the devil perverts it. Whether it be marital intimacy, the devil has a plan for that too. And it's, it's immorality, it's fornication, it's being a whoremonger, it's uh, uh, being guilty of, of adultery. That's his plan. Anything God gives us, the devil wants to pervert it, change it. And especially in this area of finances. There's no way I know all I need to know about it. I, I am crippled too high for crutches to tell you everything that needs to be said about finances. Someone did the counting, and there's 2,300, 550, 2,350 references to money and possessions in the Bible. That's interesting. You, you probably, I don't know how many pages in the Bible, but that's probably one for every page. That God puts finances or possessions of almost half of the parables that Jesus spoke about, he used money to get the attention and to teach a lesson, a heavenly story with a, uh, uh, with an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Because he knew that would get. He held up a coin, and when he did, everybody paid attention. Because it always gets our attention. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's an interesting book, and I'm going to speak on it this morning and again tonight. I knew that we would have a little bit of preliminaries today and might take a shorter time to this morning and not too long tonight, but I feel like I want to finish this passage of Scripture. I think it's very helpful. There are some things in the Scripture the Bible tells us, and this is written by the richest man to probably ever walk the face of the earth, Solomon. Many people have done the comparison between how much Solomon had, how much gold and silver and things that he had, and it was a guy who really had it all. He could do anything he wanted to do. He could be anything he wanted to be. He was the king, the envy of all the kings and queens of the day. They would come to see him and see his kingdom, and they would walk away saying, the half wasn't told me. This is unbelievable. This guy has happy servants. He, he has uh, happy, happy people, and, and now just the wealth and the, and the wisdom is just off the charts. And he had it all. He could do anything he wanted to do, be anything he wanted to be. He could have anything he wanted to have. And, and yet he became a wise fool and made an idiot of himself. He really just went, he, it, it got to his head. It changed his heart. It made him a pervert in his uh, physical relationship. It made him skewed and, and uh, lose, uh, lose his mental capacities in some areas. But as an old man, God inspired him to write the book of Ecclesiastes, and he gives us some thoughts, especially in almost the last chapter of the book, chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes. And he tells us some things that are financial principles and living principles that I think can be very applicable to everyone who's willing to sit up and listen this morning. So look at it, if you would please, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible says this, and brother, wait, let me just real quickly, I can't help but go with chapter 10 for a second. And let's just look real quickly at verse number 18. By much slothfulness, the buildings decay. And through the idleness of hands, the house droppeth through. He said, you got to, you got to, it takes work to maintain your property. 
You know, uh, it takes work to maintain a marriage. If you're working your marriage, your marriage is probably working. If you're not working your marriage, your marriage is probably not working. I oftentimes say you've got to keep working on it. Every marriage needs maintenance. He said, listen, laziness will cause all kinds of issues. Real quickly, look at the, the next, uh, look at verse, verse 20, for sake of time. Curse not the king. No, not the, in thy thought. Your authorities of your life, don't curse them. Don't even, not even your thinking. Curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. In your bedroom, don't even say negative things about others. For a bird in the air shall carry the voice that hath wings shall tell the matter. He's going to come back to bite you. It's going to come back to haunt you. Loose lips sink ships. When you try to say some stuff, he says, he says listen, watch your mouth. <laughs> watch what you say. And before that, watch what you think. Especially in critical moments. Just advice there. But now he changes his attention to the financial, financial matters. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 11. Read it out loud with me, would you please, everyone? Cast thy bread upon the waters. Look at verse number 2. Read it with me. Give a portion to seven and also to eight. Verse number 3 says, If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind will not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Verse 5, read it with me. And thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, even so thou knowest not the works of God. The Bible says in verse number 6, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand, for thou knowest not whether thou shalt prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Truly the light is sweet, and the pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness for they shall be many, all that cometh is vanity. Verse number 9, read it with me. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, in the day of thy youth. But, but all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood, uh, and youth or vanity. Father, please help me in the few moments we've together. We've read the chapter. I pray you'd help me to make the sense. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple thoughts here real quickly about finance. And we've heard a lot about it this uh, month. We've had skilled, uh, faithful, loyal people to the Lord Jesus Christ come behind here. And boy, Brother Alfred, unbelievable job this morning. Wasn't that great? Helpful and wisdom is what our wisdom will help us manage finances. You know, if any man lack money, let him ask of God. That's not what he said. What we need, you know, what you probably have a, as much money as God can trust you with. You probably have as much finances and control of finances right now as you have the wisdom to handle it. So, if we need a little bit more, or we think we need more, what might we ask for? Wisdom. And then when God sees wisdom, he gives us riches and honor and life. Many of us, we don't have wisdom. That's why we don't, we're not managing properly or not managing what we'd like to manage. That's a good point. I love that. That was very helpful to me. And every speak, speaker has been a help this year, this uh, month. But here Solomon, the wise man ever lived, gives some advice after many years of uh, being blessed by God and flushing the blessings that God gave him. But he evaluates some things, and he says some things very wise. First thing he says is, cast your bread upon the water, and it will return to you in many days. Um, Solomon was a, was a king. He had plenty of money, and he built ships with a guy named Hiram. You'll see Hiram's name mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 9 and 1 Kings chapter 10. For sake of time, we won't go there. But it does say in 23 and 24 of chapter 10 that he made navy ships... And he spent money to invest in them, put crews on them, and sent and cast his earnings on the waters, and they went out, and they would go out for about three years sometimes. But when they came back, they came laden with gold and silver and uh, special animals from, the, from other countries and, 
and niceties and different spices and things of that nature. And he would send out these ships, and he wouldn't see any return for a long time. But he kept on investing. He took that, and he sent them out, and I'm sure maybe thought, well, he'll be back by now. There was no emails to send out. There was no, uh, uh, you know, text messages to give. He's just waiting for them to come back. And then he said, you know what? I, I didn't just send out one or two. I sent out, give a portion to seven ships and even into eight. He sent out a lot of them in different directions because he didn't know what would happen in the situation. You look at that verse number two. Would you look at that with me? Verse number two, the Bible says, give a portion to seven and also to, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. He said, now, I don't know what kind of storm one is going to hit. I don't know what they're going to encounter. I don't know what's going to take place. So I put some of my bread, some of my finances in one ship and two ship and three ship and four ship, five ship, seven, and I even gave it to eight because you never know what one of them might happen to them. It's interesting, isn't it? Here's a couple principles that we can take, and I think this is good for our finances as well as our life. Number one principle, verse number one, cast your bread on the waters and it will return back to you in many days. And that is the principle to invest. You only one life, so soon it will, only what's done for Christ will do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. You'll be rewarded for the things done while in your body. You've got a, just a little parenthesis called life that you have a chance to make a dent in eternity. And God is telling us throughout the Scriptures, keep investing, keep investing, keep investing. Some of the motivational uh, stories that God told while Jesus was here on the earth, the parables, are about a man who would go on a long journey. Every, the three parables... He would give each of them ten servants, one talent, and he would come back and see what they had done with it. He gave one five, one one, uh, two, one one. He would go back and see. We we see each time that the the, the boss would give some information, he would give an entrustment, a stewardship, and then he would leave and he would come back. And he was teaching that he wanted them to invest. You remember about the one guy? What did he do? One of them took the five and he made ten. He invested. He used what he was given by his boss, by his Lord. He doubled it, and when he came back, he had proven he had invested. The two got four. The one, what did he do? He buried it. He failed to invest it. Didn't even put it in the bank. Was the, was the Lord happy? No, good night. He was angry. He was frustrated. Are you kidding me? I gave you that? And he said, well, the reason I didn't do it is because you are not a good Lord. You reap where you don't collect, or you, you're, you're just trying to get, you reap where you don't sow, and you're a crude person. You know, that's the reason why many of us do not give to the things of God. We don't trust God. We don't trust Him. And we're going we're gonna to go into the judgment seat of Christ and explain why it wasn't fair for me to invest because you didn't, you weren't good to me. You didn't meet my criteria. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. So I didn't trust you, so that's why I didn't give. You think that's going to hold water at the judgment seat of Christ? Listen here, Spanky, that won't work. That is not going to be something you do. And the, the wise advice here is to cast your bread upon the water. Keep investing. Invest when you don't even see a return. This reminds me of the pastor's scripture in the book of Galatians, where it says that... Um, if you sow to the flesh, you'll have the flesh reap corruption. If you sow the Spirit, he tells us to keep on sowing. You reap what you, you reap according to what you sow. You sow a little, you reap a lot. A little. You, you sow a lot, you reap a lot. You always reap after you sow. And the advice here given to us financially is to keep investing. Money is for making it's for spending, it's for saving, and it's for investing. And investing our finances in the things of God's importance. So, well, you know, I've been giving to the Lord, and it's my finances are not a whole lot better. Hey, listen, uh, that's, that's not to be determined now. That's later. Those are things that go on. But, you know, sometimes, well, I've been trying to go sowing. I haven't got anyone saved yet. Well, listen, keep sowing. Have you ever heard when someone says the ship has come in? 
their ship came in. It's probably a reference to this passage of Scripture. Many of us, we, we say, well, I've been pure all these years, and now I still don't have a husband. I don't have a wife. I've tried to be pure, and nothing's happened, so I'm just going to do what I do. You know what? You might want to keep on investing in purity. You might want to keep on being pure. Well, I mean, I, I'm a teenager, and I see all the other kids and things of that nature, and, and you know, you ought to, might want to just keep on doing the right thing. Keep on doing the right thing over and over. Keep casting your bread upon the waters. Don't get anxious when your ship hasn't come in yet. He says, I want you to keep investing financially. Keep investing in the things of God and the eternal things. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Uh, take a moment, if you would. You can look in, in um, Proverbs 11. In verse 26, the Bible says, there is that scattereth, that, that soweth, and yet increases. There is that withholdeth more than they need, and yet they tend to be impoverished or in poverty. Here's the advice from the wisest man. The first principle is invest. The second principle is to diversely invest. To not put all your eggs in one basket. Why? Because you never know what one day may bring forth, what's going out there, what, what evil there is in the earth. And it's a, it's a, it's a thought of diverse, diversion or being diverse or distributing differently. In today's market, we would call it a mutual fund. Listen, always be aware of anyone who wants you to take all their money and put it in their investment. Okay, that's stinking thinking. And verse 2 tells us that. Someone said, oh, no, if you just get all your money, get it out of there and give it to me, and I'll invest it for you, and then we can have that. You, don't, you want to run away from that guy. And the Bible tells us, he said, give it to seven, then to eight. This is one of the reasons I love being a part of First Baptist Church. I love giving here. Because when I gave my money today with Linda, I sat down, we prayed together this morning, we put our offering in for our missions that we do every week. We're getting ready to go to a new missions conference in March, and we'll hopefully, the Lord will let us give more through us than he gave to us. But every, that money is going 300 and some odd different ways. It's, it's helping people in Vietnam and in Laos and in Africa and in Australia, in different places of the world. It's going everywhere. It's diverse. It's, it's diverse. Every once in a while, someone will say, you know, I tell you, our mission, we only have two missionaries. We're putting all of it into theirs. No, it, there's no wrong way to support missions. I just kind of like the diversion. I like to be able to know that God is getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, and I have a little role with God in that area. I thank God for the bus ministry. I thank God for the bus ministry. I thank God for people who, diver who we can give to the bus ministry, where we can give to City Baptist, we can give to Hammond Baptist, we can help House Anderson College, we can do different things, because God says you never know what, the, what evil's in the earth. By the way, if you can learn something to do that God wants you to do, don't just stay in one realm. Listen, a victory for one is a victory for all in the Lord's work. Can you say that with me? A victory for one. One more time. A victory for is a victory. Listen, when City Baptist has a blessing, praise the Lord. When Hammond Baptist has a blessing, praise the Lord. When our Spanish congregation has a blessing, praise the Lord. When our bus ministry has a big day, praise the Lord. When the RU ministry has something special, thank God for that. When Better Roads is doing well, amen. When the rescue mission can be encouraged, that's wonderful. When our missions project is going, that's great. You know, I like it because I get to invest in different places. I, I don't want to think about this, but it's a fight to keep buses on the road. I'm glad we do it. And we, if the Lord will help me as a, your leader in this church, we'll do that till Jesus comes. But I've got some friends in California, they can't even run a bus unless it's almost new. They have to buy a new bus to, to put on the road out there because of the emissions challenges. Or it has, to be, it has to be less than five years old or ten years old, and they're almost having to go to vans and shuttles and things just to do that. But, you know, if that ever come to us, there are other ways to still reach people. So I want a church plant, get things going in other places. Why? Because we can diversify. But, you know, I should do that myself, too. I, I should go to nursing homes, rejoice with the nursing home ministry. I should make a hospital. Well, I don't do hospitals. Maybe you ought to do hospitals. Well, I don't do nursing homes. Maybe you ought to do nursing homes. 
Well, that's not my strength. Well, maybe you ought to do something you're not real strong in. I don't know. I can't drive a bus. You know, you maybe ought to get your CDL. That may be something God's already talked to you about. Well, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do something else. You might want to keep a CDL because it might bring 60 people to church on a Sunday morning when another, when another man's in the hospital and he can't drive his bus, but you could drive for him. Diversify your talents. Diversify your gifts. Diversify your strengths that you have. Let's look at one more real quickly. I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I think number one is invest. Number two, diversify your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't just serve, this is only my own ministry. You ought to rejoice other ministries. You ought to be involved and say, how can I invest? How can I help that ministry? Well, I just have a heart for this. Well, maybe you ought to have a heart for bigger things. Maybe that's the, the, the thing God's telling us to do here. And a victory for one is a victory for all. Look at verse 3 if we can. It was he closed this morning. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. That sounds almost like, duh. If a cloud's full of rain, what's going to happen? It's going to rain. If a tree is leaning to the south and it falls toward the south, where is it going to end up? That's where it's going to be. You know, it's kind of interesting. They say that, there's always been the same amount of water on the planet as it's always been. But it's just in different, different forms. Some of it's in gaseous state or some in the clouds. Some of it's in rivers or in the ocean. That the, the, there's the same amount of water on the planet as there always is, has been. It's just in different ways. There's a cycle of life, is it not? And the same is true with a tree. A tree grows. It looks so strong. But as the time goes, it falls. And if it's not cut up for firewood, it just goes into the ground and fertilizes and another tree pops up later on. There's a cycle there. And here's, this, here's the thought, I think, of this whole thing is that, you know, uh, times are going, things are going to happen. I don't care how much money you have right now and we're have, we're, everything's talking the economy, the economy, the economy. You know, one day, just like... It was in 2006, the economy's great. 2005, economy's great. Guess what happened in 2008? It wasn't so great. Things change. And things cycle. You might feel, I'm so strong. Hang on another 50 years and see how you feel. The ant will be a burden to you. The spider, the, the little things of just stepping up a step, all of a sudden, that used to never be a problem. I used to jump up and down on these things, and now you're... You're uh, having a conversation with one foot and the other foot. Which one can go next? <laughs> and then you're creaking and aching. There's a cycle that's going on. And you know, he says, I want you to prepare. If you see a rain cloud full of water, guess what? It's going to rain. If you see a tree deteriorating and it's several, several years old, guess what? It's going to fall. And that's where you're going to find it. And the truth of the matter is, it's a teaching us that we need to invest, we need to diverse, we also need to plan for our future. We need to prepare. We need to say, you know what, there is wisdom in saving. There's wisdom in thinking about that. Now, you can get squirrely and, and save too much. Now, it's not evil to save too much in this world. It's just dumb. It's dumb because you're not going to live here forever. But it is wise to prepare. And make preparation. Why? Because you have a cloud that's full of rain. And it might be good to get an umbrella. It might be good to clean your gutters. It might be good to re-roof your house. Because it's going to happen. And in more practical stance, sense, that you know, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And if you're here today, you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. You need to be prepared. And God did all those need to be done so you could go there. In this room, there are people, if you died today, you would go to heaven to be with God forever. And there's other people that if you died today, you'd be in hell forever. In 100 years from now, all that's going to matter is where you live. With God in heaven or without him in hell. And if you're here today, you're not sure. If you were to die, you'd go to heaven. You need to be prepared. And it's not hard. God loves you and he wants you to have eternal life.
If you're a Christian, you know you're going to heaven. You need to prepare for your future. Not only in this life, but for eternal life. The Bible says to lay hold on eternal life. That means think about, grab hold of the fact, not just how I'm going to live in the next 30 years, but how is it going to be for me in the next 30 million years? And prepare for eternity. It was Amos who said in the Bible, prepare to meet your God. And Solomon says in a different way. He says, invest. Invest in multiple ways in the Lord's work. Yourself, your talents, your treasure, uh, your time, all of it. Diverse your investment. And then he says, prepare. Prepare. There are some days coming that will be difficult. Think about them. And prepare. If the tree is leaning this way, when it falls, it's going to fall there. And that's where it's going to be. If the clouds are full of rain, it's going to happen, so prepare for it. Whether it be in the next 30 years, the next 30 million, everybody ought to think about that.